Hey Dan, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you, Dave? Awesome. I'm doing fantastic. Uh, ready to ready to talk shop and learn a little bit more. Let's start off by having you just introduce yourself. All right. Yeah. So I'm Dan Baruse. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Slice Engineering. We make uh, components for 3D printers, specifically focused on how do we cram as much performance out of little tiny parts as humanly possible. So that's kind of our goal, our mission. And uh, yeah, that's what we do every day. Awesome. Yeah, I think when I think of uh, slice engineering, I think yeah, extrusion systems and uh, high technology solutions to having uh, filament uh, extrusion systems perform to their to their top notch. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly it. We we focus on really optimizing the thermal performance of hot ends and nozzles and uh, working with various extrusion systems to cram as much heat as possible into filament in a really short amount of space. And that increases your volumetric throughput. Uh, also, optimizing that melting process allows you to lower things like retractions and really just get a better uh, final output from your 3D printer. Yeah, I, I may have, uh, over, over the last few weeks, I've found myself hopefully not offending too many of our uh, hardware-specific partners, but I've sort of been saying, t t uh, telling this ethos of like, with 3D printing, some engineer wants a part, a physical part that he's designed, printed out of a certain material, and the less he notices the hardware, the software, anything in between, like that's that's all good news for the 3D printing industry in general to notice Absolutely. it less. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the hardware um, should be uh, basically invisible in the sense that it's doing its job really, really well if you never have to think about the fact that it's there. Yeah. So my hope is uh, in this conversation, we can go into like the gory details of how to succeed to noticing the hardware less, you know, like uh, <laughs> yeah. I think even... Uh, hopefully some of the listeners uh, don't know what a hot end is. So we can start <laughs> even by describing what's a, what's a hot end. Some of your main products are, are focused around that. And I think, yeah, if you don't, if you don't know, if you own a few machines and you don't know that word, you're in a good spot, man. That means you've that never a, had you're to take a really it apart. Good spot. <laughs> 3D printers and you don't know what a hot yeah. end is. Yeah. Uh, you've either gotten super lucky or, or uh, somebody advised you well on your purchases. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's same as if your if your car. If you don't know what a, a throttle body position sensor is, then yeah, I think you're in good news. You you're in good never shape. Had to replace yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think uh, I think like what's your specific background? How did slice engineering come to be? Yeah. So my background is mechanical engineering in terms of that's what I studied in school, and then after graduating, I worked for a little bit of time in the aerospace industry, uh, and then in power generation. Uh, and then moved into medical devices. So I did medical device manufacturing for most of my career. And while I was doing that, I was working at a company that specifically was working on spinal um, fusion devices. So you get in a serious car accident or some sort of trauma, your vertebrae or disc space gets collapsed and broken. You're in a lot of pain. You don't want to live that way. Uh, Surgeons can come in there and clean that up and, and put in a, a, a spacer that will basically clean up that, that space. We needed to, uh, you know, most manufacturing uses some sort of jigs and fixtures to hold parts in place and move them through the process. And so we were in a spot where we needed some jigs and fixtures and we didn't know exactly what we needed. So we thought, okay, let's rapid prototype this stuff. Let's 3D print it. But it had to go through... Uh, st a sterilization system, a high temperature sterilization system in mm -hmm. order to go into the clean room. You know, you get these medical devices implanted in your body. You don't want them full of germs and, you know, Joe's breakfast, the technician, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever he sneezed onto the, onto the, um, the factory floor. So you work in a clean room. So getting these parts into a clean room meant they had to be printed out of a, a, dimensionally stable thermoplastic that was going to survive a high temperature heat cycle. And that really only leaves a few options, peak and, uh, and PEI and PEC. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with, with those materials, they're higher temperature materials. Peak is polyether ether ketone. It is a material that uh, can be used as, for example, a bearing material in uh, submarine uh, out drive output shafts. So you're talking about you know, high salinity, 
um, you know, high amount of rotating velocity, a lot of wear potential. And so that's the type of place where this plastic is used. And so we needed something like that to go in through this process. Uh, so engineering material, difficult to, to mess with. And when we were working on this, we realized that we had some limitations with the 3D printers that we were playing with and they couldn't print this thermoplastic. But even though it's a hardcore thermoplastic, it's still thermoplastic. It still goes through the same you know, states of matter. It's solid at room temperature. You heat it up, it goes into this sort of gooey state called glass transition. And then after that, it becomes a liquid, uh, just like what you'd experience with you know, other materials like water. As, as we describe 3D printing, uh, it's like a fancy hot glue gun. It's like a fancy hot glue gun. Exactly. Yeah. I love that example. It's a, a hot end is a hot glue gun. It's mm -hmm. the hot glue gun part of the 3D printer. So if you Yeah. The rest is just a mechatronic device controlling it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you, if you've got a, you know, whatever, a sewing machine that moves along an axis, that's basically the, the motion control system, but in, you know, 3D. And then uh, if you have, um, like weed whacker line that's basically like filament the mm -hmm. hot glue gun you mm -hmm. feed the weed whacker line into the hot glue gun which is the hot end it melts it squirts out the liquid version of that filament onto a plate and that's 3d printing essentially i believe that's the most succinct uh my four-year-old could understand it way of describing <laughs> exactly. 3d printing yeah exactly. there's a fancy animation uh that would make this very popular but yeah that's a great yeah. description of it that would be a fun thing to animate, actually. That, that would be really cool to animate. You got like a glue yeah. gun comes in here, a weed whacker line. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you guys should make that video next. <laughs> uh, we'll, put it on, we'll put it on deck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So we had, to, we had to print something out of these uh, plastics, these high temperature plastics, and it was hard to do. So we started looking at, okay, how do we optimize the thermodynamics of the printing process, of the hot glue mm -hmm. gun part of the printing process, the hot end? And that essentially turned into what became the Mosquito Hot End. And we launched a company around that. Awesome. Um, ended up leaving my day job to do this. Yeah. Fascinating jump, blast. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we started in a garage, you know, like all good startup stories. We started in a garage. And then about a year and a half in, I was able to, my partner and I were both able to switch to doing this full time. And we've been going steady on that for a few years now. That's awesome. So what types of machines were you using? Because obviously to print PEC or PEI or something like that on a, you know, very expensive industrial machine is already essentially figured out. You could buy your way into some of the larger Stratasys or 3D systems uh, machines. So what, what's, what base uh, mechatronic device were you <laughs> utilizing or what architecture? Yeah. So back in 2016, when we started working on this, there were only... Uh, a handful of companies that could actually print peak mm -hmm. and they mostly weren't in the United States. Actually, they were mostly in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't literally could not get our hands on a machine that would do it. Gotcha. The, you know, certainly the technology has evolved since then. Uh, we were actually using some, our early test beds were uh, some craft bot machines. Oh, uh, interesting. So, cool. yeah, so not, uh, not, certainly not designed for high temperature materials. Um, so yeah, but now our hot ends can go on just about everything. Uh, everything from, you know, we have customers printing with Ender 3s mm -hmm. all the way up to uh, one of our OEM customers is a company called Hage 3D. They're out of Austria and they have a quarter million dollar uh, five axis, you know, system that sure. moves the hot end all around and, and yeah. you can essentially build some really cool parts that you couldn't do any other way. Uh, with a five axis um, CNC type 3D printer. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then who was your, like when you, uh, so you did some design to solve some unique problems to get the the heat break and the system kind of set up. Like how did, how did slice engineering come to be? Like, what did you think? Oh, I think we've got a product and uh, here's our market. And how'd you, mm -hmm. how'd you chase after that, uh, that type of that type of like coming going from an R and R and D idea to you know potentially a medical device company to I think we should fork this off and it should be its own thing. Yeah. So we, uh, Chris is my my co founder and he was 
primarily the one doing the the design work. And when he got it to a point where it worked and we saw that we were basically eliminating heat creep, which is uh, a phenomenon where as the hot end continues to stay hot and you're going through the printing process, you get peat buildup that goes up the filament path and essentially the filament gets liquidy uh, farther and farther up the, up the line of the, of the weed whacker line mm -hmm. essentially. Right. So when you start doing that, you can jam the printer. Uh, it causes all sort of weird print artifacts. So we wanted to eliminate that problem uh, and get it hotter. And when we realized we'd come up with a solution for that, the thought was, okay, well, uh, we can just sort of bury this. Uh, the project that we had initially started, the reason we, the project that initiated the reason for us to do this work had already, the ship, that ship had sailed. Like they'd found another way to do it. Uh, and there was no, like the project had sailed. So at that point it was just, a, it was a hobby. It was a curiosity, a, um, you know, a problem that didn't have a solution and we were compelled to find a solution. So once we had a solution, we were like, okay, now we've got a solution to a problem that the company no longer has, mm -hmm. but people out there still have. Sure. Uh, so let's just see, let's see what the reception is like. We built 35 prototypes, I think, in our first sort of, you know, pre-production run, so to speak. Yep. And we went to a trade show and just set up and introduced ourselves to people and said, hey, this is something we've built. What do you think about it? And uh, we sold out in like three hours. So oh, wow. I'm like, oh, okay, that's we cool. Thing. <laughs> There's, we have a thing. Yeah, this, this, this could work. And uh, we actually, so the people that bought the last, they, the people bought all of the display units that we had too. So we asked them to hold off till the end of the show to actually pick them up. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a bidding war for our, our last couple <laughs> where people were like, awesome. here, give me, give me, you know, I'll give you my money. You just give it to me. That's good uh, market research for a uh, price was, threshold. Yeah, <laughs> it was good market research. So we decided from there, all right, there, there's obviously a need, a real need, not just something that we perceived was a need, but there's a market need. And yeah, so that validated our hypothesis that this was a real problem. And we decided to to launch something. Awesome. How did you come up with the uh, name Slice Engineering? Which, as a side note, I love receiving emails from Dan because it says, says stay zesty at the very, <laughs> the very bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the stay zesty thing came a little bit later. Um, but Slice Engineering, I mean, we knew at the core of it, we're an engineering company, even though we're an engineering company that makes hot ends. We're not a hot end company that does engineering, if that makes sense. Yep. So we, most of the staff is engineers. Uh, we have engineers answering help desk tickets. We have engineers helping with literally everything because uh, that's the way we think. We are an engineering company. So we're trying to solve engineering problems. So I wanted engineering to be in the name. And then I was thinking everybody has 3D in their name somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't want 3D in the name because everybody has 3D in the name. I just want to be a little bit different. And so I started thinking about the 3D printing process and how everything is done in layers. And I was like, well, slices, things are done in slices. And then we live in Florida and there's like a lot of citrus in the area. And when I was in high school, we would, well, my high school is in the middle of nowhere. So we would... Uh, I was on a cross, cross country team and we would run through mm -hmm. orange groves and uh, strawberry fields. And so different times of the year, you know, it, it's, it's ripe. Yep. And so we would, we would uh, have fights with the oranges. Sure. And so I've always had this, like, I don't know, really a significant appreciation for, uh, for oranges and nice. anything zesty. As a, as a dude from orange County, I think the same story exists in the seventies in orange County. Now it's just a bunch <laughs> of homes, but <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that used to be the case. Um, so let's talk, I do want to get like, you know, as, as deep as, uh, as you'd like, uh, as I, as uh, two engineers chatting about, uh, extrusion systems and hot ends and heat creep as we can get, um, into those, you know, the technology that you're bringing from the table, how it's different from other things on the market. So I think the best place to start there is, 
maybe just uh, on the surface describe the Mosquito Hada, which was your first, as you were describing your first product that solved the problem of, you know, a more high temperature solution for desktop 3D printers that could get to these temperatures, maintain them and print some of those uh, more for performance materials. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like you said, Mosquito was our first product and we've sort of expanded that product line since then. But the core of the Mosquito technology is, is really two things. One, we found that the one of the limitations of the sort of state of the art what was available at the time was that the heat break in a hot end, uh, I guess, first of all, I'll explain what a heat break is. So like we mentioned earlier, the plastic is coming in as in solid form and it goes through this sort of gooey glass transition phase mm -hmm. and then becomes a liquid for a brief period of time before it gets squirted out onto the, the build plate and then cooled back into a solid. So that, uh, while it's transitioning from a solid to a liquid, it goes through what's called a heat break. And that heat break separates the cold part of the hot end where the heat sink is from the hot part of the hot end. You want the cold part to be as cool as possible and so the plastic stays solid and you want the hot part to be as hot as possible to melt the, not, well, within you know a range, within mm -hmm. the right temperature range to melt that particular plastic uh, polymer, depending on what it is. So the heat break is what separates those two sections and you want the heat break to be as efficient as possible at reducing the amount of heat that travels up from the hot section to the cold section. So that's what the heat break does. So in an ideal world, you would have an infinitesimally thin heat break because uh, conductive heat transfer, which is the most efficient form of heat transfer is a function of cross-sectional area. So if, for example, if you take your whole hand and you put it on a hot stove, you will burn your whole hand. You will get mm -hmm. a lot of yep. heat transferred to your hand. If you just put your the tip of your finger on the hot stove, you will only burn the tip of your finger, not the rest of your hand, because mm -hmm. you're only transferring heat efficiently in that zone. Because thank goodness the rest of your body is, uh, is okay, a bag yeah. of water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so same concept applies for the heat break. You want it to be as thin as possible to transfer as little heat as possible up, but still guide the filament where you want it to go. Conversely, previous hot ends had a, another problem in that the heat break was the only thing that connected the hot and cold zones. Uh, because again, you want as little cross-sectional area going up as possible. So the trade-off inherent in that structure is that the heat break needs to be as thin as possible to conduct less heat, but also as thick as possible to hold those two parts together mm -hmm. in a dynamically moving stability. system. Right. And you need stability. So we decided, okay, why have one part do two functions? Let's have one part do one function and create another part to have, take care of the other function. So we made our heat break extremely thin and I can dive more into that later. We, we turned, made it a composite. Essentially it's a, uh, construction of two separate materials put together. And then we built a roll cage uh, structure around that heat break. So the roll cage takes care of the uh, structural sort of handling forces under dynamic load while the printer is moving. And then the heat break takes care of the actual breaking of the heat. Uh, and that is not a loaded member. It's not under any stress uh, from loads that are inherent to the dynamic nature of the printing process. Uh, so that's technology part one. Part two is, as I mentioned, the heat break is a composite. So instead of having a monolithic or a single material mm -hmm. heat break, we have now made a bimetallic heat break. It's two different metals conjoined together. And so we have a copper section in the bottom and a copper section in the top. The copper section in the bottom brings heat from the hot block into the filament as quickly as possible to help increase uh, flow rates because it, we're melting the filament faster and higher up in the melt zone. And then we've got the copper section in the top to dissipate the heat as quickly as possible. So you're reducing, further reducing heat creep. And then that middle section is actually a steel alloy that is uh, a hardened steel. So it's very, the specific strength is high, meaning the amount of strength per unit of area is very high, but the um, conduction 
the ability of the that alloy to conduct heat from one mm -hmm. part to another is relatively low as compared to other um, metal materials. So you end up with really good heat conduction in the bottom, really good heat conduction in the top, and relatively very poor heat conduction in the center, uh, which will translates into 85% less heat going up the filament path. So essentially to summarize, that was a very long explanation, to summarize everything, we created a roll cage and made a very efficient heat break by using composite technology as opposed to monolithic um, machining practices. So the, the heat, <clears throat> when you say the heat break, you're talking about uh, really just isolating the puddle of liquid polymer from the uh, filament strand or the uh, weed whacker line coming in, right? Yep, exactly. That's exactly. And you're able to do that with uh, multiple materials and isolating the heat break from the mechanical structure, which is where your roll cage comes in. And, and that's the first thing I noticed um, when you sold those first 35 units is like, oh, wow, that's interesting. They they sort of made the mechanical structure, uh, the perimeter of connecting things together and isolated any of the mechanical uh, structure from being dependent on that heat break, which is super thin and uh, already very hot. So your, <laughs> your mechanical properties drop a little bit on the, on, the, on the curve of metal, you're dropping very little, but a little. Yep. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, and then the the next part that I think is you know beyond the bimetallic is the actual structure of the roll cage and some uh, from my perception like some off the shelf components that you guys cleverly put into the system, right? Yeah, so we we took basically um, hypodermic needle tubing, right? So uh, the medical industry has been making hypodermic needles for a very long time. Decades, yes. Yeah really really good at it and they can make an extremely smooth uh bore on the internal diameter that is great for uh you know filament passing through because the smoother that uh surface the less likely you are to get hung up on there uh, that the that the plastic the melting plastic is going to get hung up inside and cause a clog somewhere um, yeah so that's that's essentially we, we took that idea and ported it into the um, hot end structure. Yeah, and you use that for both the heat break and the mechanical structure roll cage. Right, exactly, yeah, because again, very high, it's a very high strength material, but is uh, can be, because of the strain hardening that it goes through, the work hardening, it uh, can be very, very thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, so that kind of talks about the zone in between uh, the heat break and the heat block that you are trying to make as thin as possible because when it's thinner, the essentially the part quality and the machine reliability are both increased, less prone to jams and higher quality parts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and then what about the other components of the the Mosquito and the newer versions of hot ends that you've released? Yeah, so the we've taken some of those basic ideas and, and applied them to other products. Uh, so we came out with a higher flow version of the Mosquito called the Magnum. Uh, we also came out with a liquid cooled version called the Mosquito Liquid uh, for uh, applications where you're printing in a with very high temperatures in an enclosed chamber where you need, I mean, for example, a lot of peak machine, peak mm -hmm. printing machines are using an enclosed chamber and liquid cooling. So that's a, an application there. And then most recently we came out with our Magnum Plus hot end, which is a uh, 100 watt, up to 100 watt um, hot end that has some very, very high flow characteristics. So it's about uh, three and a half to four times faster than sort of the state of the art uh, hot end that's available on the market. And we also took the bimetallic heat break technology and applied it to a more traditional hot end design. That's kind of a lower cost option mm -hmm. for people that have, a you know, maybe a lower cost machine and they, they want to make a, um, still take advantage of some of those benefits, but without, you know, spending more on, on a full hot end upgrade. 
And uh, in terms of the, let's just, if you focus on the cooling side of things, what sort of materials are you using on the, on the cold side of the hot end? Mostly using aluminum. Uh, aluminum is, is a pretty good heat sink material uh, in the terms that it's relatively inexpensive, it's easy to machine and it's easy to anodize and make look mm -hmm. nice so mm -hmm. <laughs> so we it's like funny. aluminum for heat sinks uh yeah so most of our heat sinks are aluminum we do have some interesting alloys that we use in different places but uh for the most part we're using you know aircraft grade aluminum what what people would normally recognize um 6061 is probably people cool. are probably most familiar with that type of aluminum and i would assume you're extruding it and then machining it yeah, so we're buying a, uh, in the case of the Mosquito, it's, yeah, it's a long extrusion, a long bar mm -hmm. that then gets cut down. Um, I love CNC processes. I know some people in, in the industry aren't that excited about, you know, subtractive manufacturing, but I just like manufacturing in general. I love additive. Uh, I also think subtractive is super cool. Um, Metal injection molding is super cool. Injection molding is cool. Like I just like oh, awesome. One doesn't live without the other. Made. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're all uh, support each other for sure. There are different applications where each one makes sense. And yeah, so I forget where I was going. That oh CNC. So we we have to CNC our parts because they're metal metal uh, large quantity metal parts. And I'd love to find a way to metal three D print some of our stuff. But uh, I think we're maybe a couple of years away from that. In any sure. Case, yeah, we cut. It's 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 here and working. Uh, if you need something three sixteen or seventeen four pH uh, BASF, certainly that's a, that's an option. That's I think un, under noticed in the industry actually that you your any home at home three D printer can uh, succeed with metal three D printing. Yeah, I like the Ultrafuse stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, that's BASF's you know three sixteen. Um, well, I guess it's their metal brand in general, but we have the three sixteen L uh, filament that they make and. Yeah, some cool stuff. We, you know, 316 is not, well, neither stainless, no stainless steel is, is really the ideal heat sure. sink material, yep. but it is a good um, thing to prototype with. And, and I, I'm sure there are end use applications not related to heat transfer that yes. would just be perfect for that material. Yes. It's uh, it's it's known for its uh, sturdiness and robustness, and uh, yep. taking on uh, a lot of uh, chemical disturbances and stuff, mm -hmm. less for its uh, heat transfer purposes. And what about the heat heater block? Like, do you guys have any interesting uh, insights into those materials and what's best? Because much of the industry kind of talks about you really have a resistor that's applying the heat. You've got a ther you know a thermistor or a thermocouple, depending on the uh, inputs. Um, controlling the temperature and turning on and off that resistor. Like there's a lot going on in this tiny little system, especially when you add in some copper and then a brass nozzle or a hardened steel nozzle of some sort. So at the end of the day, I think the heat block's just there to be like the steady eddy of that system, just pumping in the right amount of heat at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the heat block is is really, you need a certain amount of thermal mass, right? You You need to maintain the thermal mass. The main a uh, heat sink in the in terms of where the energy goes in this system is actually the filament right you're heating it up and it's it's pulling heat out of out of the hot block and so you got to keep it at a consistent temperature over time so having a, a more conductive material is is really helpful so all of our uh, hot blocks are made of uh, a copper alloy that is uh, a pretty hard alloy that is designed to withstand some uh, abuse and then we nickel plate it it's a uh, nickel helps with adhesion uh, and and it look and it looks nice you know it's shiny, shiny. it's easy to laser mark as well yeah so shiny is good <laughs> um shiny is also good for uh for radiation so radiative uh, heat transfer so uh so that's basically what we do on that end we've got some um some copper, a nice copper alloy that we use that's hardened and then, and then nickel plating it. We do something kind of weird in the industry in the sense that we don't use set screws or clamps to contain our, our heaters and sensors. And uh, the reason behind that is that in injection molding, 
you're typically going to be installing a heater into a mold with a thermal paste and mm -hmm. sort of retaining it with a screw to keep it from backing out. And what that does is actually extends the life of the heater because it's not under any circumferential load. So that's why we do that that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly get a lot of questions about it because it's weird. Uh, at least in additive manufacturing, it's weird, but it's not weird in industry as a I whole. And um, so, yeah, so that's why we do that. It's, it's strange, but it is what it is. It's strange, but I think it talks to sort of the the uh, the unfair advantage that slice engineering has in ter in terms of bringing those types of things to market when you're talking about using hypodermic needles from uh, you know a previous life as a medical device engineer, and you're talking about thermal paste, which is um, a knowledge base that comes from injection molding, like. That's what the desktop 3D printing space needs. It's how it, it's how it grows. It has, it's how it becomes more reliable. And I think you know every decision that you're talking about uh, that was consciously made, anyhow, is speaking to exactly that. Even um, you know, we were, I was talking to a few people in the industry the first time that say the the Capricorn tubing uh, came out. It was you know blue tubing that's specifically diametered for the 3D printing industry and. You know, it's kind of someone was asking, like, is is that worth is it worth getting on? And my my only opinion was somebody made something specifically for a 3D printer when we were actually using water tubing off the shelf before. I think it's great. This is what we need. You know, this is the focus that we need. Something that's 1.75 millimeter plus the tolerance ready to constrain that path makes the extrusion system in general more reliable. And again, that's just bringing technology from outside of uh, sort of the hobbyist desktop 3D printing space. Uh, you know, you and I, at least, talking here as engineers uh, who have previous lives and uh, <laughs> a lot of rigor put into solving specific things. I think it's the right the right place that the desktop 3D printing industry needs to head. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, and and I think Capricorn is a great example because. You know, they have a, like you said, a very specific tolerance on that inner diameter and it's there for a reason. And the extrusion of that PTFE line is very consistent and they're using a longer chain PTFE than, you know, what is in water tubing, for example, because it's designed to uh, take the temperature. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, something that not a lot of people talk about PTFE and all polymers, right? They come in yep. different lengths and yep. that plays a difference on cross-linking and, and, uh, the material properties. And so wherever we can take sort of previous knowledge that already exists out there and apply it into 3D printing, you're going to see a better reliability. You're going to see more um, consistent results. And that's really where we've shined as a company. Our, our biggest customers are actually print farms uh, okay. or companies that are doing low volume manufacturing of sort of customizable parts because they care about the fact that every one of their machines needs to have the same output every time. And so they will come in and buy, you know, 50, a hundred, uh, 200 hot ends and they'll build the same toolkit for all of their machines. Mm -hmm. And that goes on there and they know how to easily change a nozzle. They know how many hours they've got on that, on that tool head. Uh, and it just runs, you know, and that's, that's what they need to make their business model work. And so we're really excited to work with customers like that because we can help them make their dreams come true of whatever it is that their business is doing. And uh, yeah, that gets me excited. Yeah, absolutely. Solving the problem of, and you know, at least from, from Matter Hackers, a big growing portion of our customer base is the exact same uh, case of, you know, anywhere from Etsy shops to manufacturing mm -hmm. partners that are yep. 3D printing a lot of stuff, you know, and it's 3D printing is chosen not because it's high volume, but because maybe it's uh, lower to mid volume or every part's a little different. So injection molding is really not an option. Um, yeah. And, and that's where that's where 3D printing really lies. And that's where a big growth in the industry. And I think even if someone's out there, uh, you know, just kind of as a tinkerer, yeah. Etsy, Etsy shop typed uh, print farms. Uh, it's a reason the you know an entire family can quit their day job and just be yeah. focused on something like that. And I'm I'm surprised every day at new customers that call in that that is their case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we love hearing those stories because 
like you mentioned, the you know sometimes they got two or three printers and the, and somebody came up with a great idea, and they're the fact that they can take that to market so quickly is a testament to what three D printing is doing for the world, really, right? You know, even though whatever this person is doing may just be a small thing that has a small, relatively small impact, but in aggregate, as more and more people get exposed to, to this technology and they're able to see, okay, I don't have to pay ten to $20,000 to get a mold made to then just try something and see if it works. And now yeah. I can spend 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, get something to market, test it, see if it works. And if it works, fantastic, you know, open the floodgates, let's go, let's try it out. Uh, and that can have a massive impact on a family, on, mm -hmm. um, and on the it's consumer market business. in general. Yeah. Right. Growing business in general. Yeah. yeah. I have, uh, you know, I've brought to market and designed, you know, uh, tens, maybe even hundreds of metal, like actual injection molded plastic parts. And, and every time when you send it off to the molder and you say, yep, make this, it is anxiety inducing no matter what you do. So every the flexibility, time. <laughs> flexibility of uh, being able to have um, a quick iterative cycle that uses 3D printing is great. Um, I guess in, in general, like what sets um, Slice Engineering's products apart from, from the rest of the industry? Like if someone's out there shopping for something, why choose, why choose something that your company's making? So a few reasons. One, we are committed to really high quality standards. So I know that's sort of a cliche thing to say. People say, oh, quality. But I mean, we're coming from the, the background that we do we voluntarily implement ISO standards in our quality inspection procedures and in, in the way we do everything from the original, you know, drawing of a part to when it ships out to a customer. We're, we've got engineers looking at doing quality inspection and making sure that the parts meet specification and we're not just mass producing to get stuff out the door as quickly as possible. Yep. I really, really do care about what every single part looks like uh, as it leaves. Doesn't, make, doesn't mean we never make a mistake, but it means we catch most of the ones that we do. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, the other part of it is really the technology side. You know, we're a technology leader, maybe uh, I'd like to say the technology leader in the hot end space. Yep. And that, you know, makes a difference if you want the best that's that's us that's um, it yeah <laughs> so the last aspect of it and and this is probably more important for our u.s audience but we make by volume 98 percent of our stuff is made in the united states and so we're passionate about one of our core values is actually making as many things lo as local as possible and so like our packaging gets printed mostly here in Gainesville, Florida, where we live. Hmm. Uh, and so we're giving, you know, business to another local business. Uh, some of our packaging comes from Canada because that was the closest we could get that particular item. But, uh, you know, go Canada. Uh, so as much as we can, we're trying to do as local as possible. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the sustainability aspect. Obviously, the more local you're doing things, the less of an impact you're having on the environment. And then the second aspect is, uh, and this is, I'm going to get a little personal here, but I didn't actually grow up in the United States. I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen, but uh, I, my, my parents do missions work. And so I grew up in being around a lot of very abject poverty and seeing a lot of uh, pretty intense things overseas, including... Uh, things like human trafficking and, and uh, stuff like that. And so I'm very passionate about the conditions under which people work. Yeah. And so we are very uh, passionate about the supply chain of where our stuff comes from yep. and making sure that the people in the entire supply chain are being paid fairly, being treated fairly, uh, that they have a living wage, that they um, can go home at night, just one, go home at night, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. but two, be able to come home and say to their family, you know, yeah, I did a job well done today. And, 
so we're very passionate about that and and that's that's why we do stuff domestically as much as we can as local as as local as possible you know where yeah that's great to hear i i didn't know about that about your background so that's good that's good to hear and uh good to be certainly fighting that fight and i you know over the last year if we've learned anything it's that the closer to home you can source things the the better your content you know business continuity yes. will be that's for sure that's true yeah uh, i went I went surfing yesterday morning and I, I saw, you know, 30 boats off the coast with a lot of stuff <laughs> waiting for Christmas to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read the report every day for uh, the backlog on mm -hmm. uh, shipping and it's, um, it's not getting any shorter. Certainly not. Yeah. Yeah. But well, that's good to hear. Uh, one like, yeah, just interesting question I have, because obviously it's it's come up a lot in our customers and the community you're involved with is you're coming to market, you're solving problems, you have unique solutions. Uh, the desktop industry generally is open source, as as uh, people may talk about, at least. But how do you balance that? Like, hey, we've got something new. We've got this unique solution versus competing in this open source industry. Obviously, it's really important, but also, you know. We have a business to run. So what do, what's, how, do you, how do you balance those things? Yeah, that's a good question. So when we um, started the business, we knew that because we were coming out with something unique, that there was going to be a copycat very, very fast. And we also knew that if we wanted to actually have an impact and be able to do things like hire people at fair wages and um, do manufacturing in the United States and continue to innovate and not just be a one hit wonder, uh, we would need to protect our market. And so we decided to pursue patents on the Mosquito. Um, in hindsight, that was definitely the right decision. And being in an open source market, what we did is uh, I definitely support open source. I think it's great when people can share knowledge and uh, share as much information as possible. But I also care about people being able to pay their mortgage and, and eat, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of people in the open source community that have put a lot of sweat equity into developing something and, and get nothing. and uh, and that's not fair. That's not right. Um, we see a lot of artists, for example, or designers put their stuff online and it gets stolen and, and reprinted and you know copied a million times. And, and that's not right. That's not fair. Um, their intellect that's their intellectual property, right? That's their idea, their concept. And it's being stolen and taken advantage of. And that's just not okay. So we knew we needed to protect ourselves as much as we could. Uh, Obviously, there's still copycats of our products, and uh, you know that's something that uh, we're certainly not excited about. Um, I'll say one more thing about the open source part, and then I'll then I'll dive into more about the uh, sort of defense actions that we've taken. We have always published our products under a uh, open source license, so we publish our CAD files online. Uh, we have some products that are fully open source that we literally have not only the step files, but the manufacturing drawings. And we're the only hardware company uh, that I'm aware of in 3D printing that is publishing actual manufacturing drawings. So if you wanted to Certainly, go and make yeah. some of our products, you could actually do that. Some of our competitors that are uh, open source and published drawings. They are very, very <laughs> rudimentary drawings. You know, you're not going to manufacture anything off of that. You're just going to sort of be able to say, oh, it's 12 millimeters wide. Yes. And some of them even uh, throw the throw the scent off the trail with uh, perceived symmetry. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There's some, there's some tricky things that you can do uh -huh. in uh -huh. for the sake of appearances of open source. And that's not part of how we do business. Um, mm -hmm. I would rather be straightforward in everything that we do. So we say when something is patented, which by the way is, is um, US law. <laughs> um, so we say when something is patented and it's very clearly marked on the product and on the packaging. And even those products will still share 
um, step files, CAD files for those yep. products. And, and if you are an educational That's institution someone, yeah. or you are a hobbyist or whatever, and you want to take that and modify it and iterate and play with it, that's totally fine. We're just asking, it's a non-commercial license. We're asking people not to yep. turn it into a product that then they are selling because then they're taking advantage of our of our work. And we also believe in FRAND, which is a um, fair and reasonable uh, licensing terms. I forget the exact acronym, but essentially it's talking about um, fair, and le fair and reasonable licensing. So if anybody wants to license, we're happy to talk to them about a licensing arrangement for yep. our patents. Um, but at the end of the day, if we want to continue to innovate, we have to be careful. And we've seen that, you know, not only with Slice, but there's now some people following suit. Uh, companies that have been open source or, or claimed open source for a long time have either gone out of business and been acquired, or they have uh, come out with their own patents because it is very, very difficult to do business otherwise. And it's not just from a, um, it's really from a defensive standpoint, because if you don't patent something, uh, somebody else can, <laughs> and, um, yep. and then you end up royally screwed, essentially, you know, uh, where you can't make your own product. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's that whole sort of defensive aspect of it. We've been accused recently of uh, intimidating people um, online and like, uh, supposedly we have a high powered lawyer that's like going around and, and intimidating people. Um, we're a small company. We don't, uh, it is not financially, does not financially make sense for us to track everybody down. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's silly, honestly, that the rumors that are being spread expensive and, uh, rarely rewarding. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Like there's no, there's zero ROI as a business yeah. for us to, yeah. to do something like that. So um, what we will do is, you know, if we're aware of of somebody that is selling products that infringe on our patents, we'll personally give them a call and say, hey, you know, uh, we'd love to work with you, um, mm -hmm. but just to make you aware, this is the problem that that is occurring, and uh, we'd like you to to stop. And you know that that usually works. People usually stop. So. Um, I think yeah, most people uh, are, are relatively reasonable. Yeah, it's a fair conversation to have, I think. Um, right. You know, as you guys are, uh, you know, leading the industry when it comes to technology and extrusion systems and um, innovative materials, designs, applications, all those things for for consumers to succeed, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the goal is for everyone to succeed at a broader sense of materials and, uh, you know, sell more products at the yeah, end of the day yeah, to, to have more people succeeding and grow the industry of what people think is possible with 3D printing. Yep. What are the, some of the coolest like use cases or customers you've seen uh, utilizing your products? Like, uh, do you have a case study that's your favorite? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Got a lot of cool, cool ones. Um, I'll, I'll give two, one sort of on the, on the sort of intense end of, of industry and then one on the, uh, on the more hobby side. So on the industry side, we one of our earliest customers was a medical device company that was interestingly also doing cervical spacers like the company mm -hmm. that I came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are very close to commercializing a 3D printed um, cervical spacer that will be um, basically patient specific. And that what that means is that Going back to that earlier example of you get in a car accident, you know, not every every car accident is completely unique and different, right? Due to the circumstances yeah. of the way it happens. So every injury is totally unique. And so, and my body doesn't look, look like yours, doesn't look like somebody else's. So uh, every body idea in an ideal world would have a totally unique implant that is specifically tailored to them. And so we've been working with this company for several years now, and they're very close to coming to market with their uh, 3D printed um, cervical spacers. So I'm super excited about that. They're using our new Magnum Plus hot end to maximize their production output. And that's going to be great because it's literally going to change people's lives awesome, uh, for the better. And on the hobby end, we've got a customer who was really passionate about uh, boating and he wanted to fly his college's flag on the back of his boat because that's fun. And he 
made uh, he th- he had a 3D printer. He made a flagpole for or a flag holder rather for his boat, and posted it on some Facebook forum. And there were a bunch of people that were like, "Hey, can you make me one of those?" And he said, "Sure." So he made a few, and kind of like us at that trade show, he realized very quickly there was a significant market, and yeah. he actually went from a very well-paying job in you know corporate world was able to quit that, and he's supporting his family now uh, all through printing flag holders for boats and he uses our magnum hot end on his printer farm and switching to our magnum hot end cut his uh his downtime by 50 percent and yeah. increased his throughput by 30 percent so you know those are those are good numbers for a for a print farm and he's supporting his family and anybody in manufacturing that can reduce uh time and labor and materials by that much yeah that's a great that's a great solution yeah for sure. absolutely Awesome. Well, Dan, I think we've learned a lot here um, about your background and slice engineering in general. I uh, want to thank you for your time. Thanks, Dave. It was a pleasure. Always enjoy chatting with you. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Where, where can people uh, find out more information or follow you on social media or something? Yeah. So sliceengineering.com is our website. You can also find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, did I miss any? Twitter. Or on Twitter too, uh, not on TikTok. Uh, not a huge fan. Some people love TikTok. I'm not a fan, but awesome. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> cool. Well, hey Dan, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Have a good one.